Thank you. So today, I'd like to talk about disasters and games. And I'm going to start with disasters because nothing gets a talk going like a little doom and gloom. But I'm, I'm an optimist, and so I'm hoping that by the end of this, you'll see the opportunities that I see in disasters and games. So let's start with disasters. On March 11th, 2013, a group of experienced paddlers were making their way down the Tennessee Little River. They knew what they were doing. This was serious whitewater. And unfortunately, one of the boats flipped. In the boat was a gentleman by the name of Steve Senior, and he wasn't able to right his boat. But he was experienced. He knew what to do. So what he did was he assumed the correct swim position, hands behind his head, feet crossed, and he went down the rapids feet first. That's exactly what he was supposed to do. He went down a six-foot drop, and he never emerged. He got his feet stuck underneath the water. And his friends, they were experienced swift water rescue technicians and swift water rescue technician instructors. And they also knew what to do. And they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They went and tried to save their friend. Someone had called 911 when they saw what had happened. And the first responders came. And the first responders did exactly what first responders are supposed to do. They wanted to secure the scene. They wanted to get everybody out of the way because they didn't want any additional potential victims. That's what they did. But Steve's friends believed that they were in a better position to save their friend. And so they argued with the first responders because they knew what they were doing. And after about five minutes on land, while Steve's underwater, they agree. Steve's friends will rescue him. And that's what they did. They pulled him out of the water. He'd been down for 27 minutes. 27 minutes underwater. They did CPR. They got his heart back. He started breathing. But he died overnight in the hospital. Those five minutes could have been the difference between whether or not Steve lived or died. Five minutes. Now I want to tell you about a different story. This happened a month later in Boston, April 15th, 2013. And those of you who know your sports know that that's the date of the Boston Marathon. And those of you who know your news know that that's the date of the Boston bombings. Tragic. They set up two bombs close to the finish line of the Boston Marathon, taking out just innocent spectators, bystanders. And when those bombs went off, something happened to the people of Boston. They did the same thing that Steve's friends did in the Little Tennessee River. They rushed to help. You see the pictures in the news of people swarming, pulling away the guardrails, helping get to the people who have been hurt, killed by this bomb. And I want to tell you about one guy. His name was Carlos Arandano. And he was just there watching, but he ran and he wanted to help. And he had a little bit of first responder experience, but not a lot. And he saw a guy by the name of Jeff, Jeff Bowman. And Jeff was bleeding copiously. Jeff eventually lost both of his legs. And Carlos decided he was going to help Jeff. And he fashioned a tourniquet, and he did everything he could do to stop the bleeding. And then when the first responders and the paramedics came, they did something very different from what happened in the Tennessee Little River. Instead of securing the scene and getting everybody out there, they engaged the community. They allowed the community to stay and help. And Carlos saved Jeff's life. If Carlos had been moved from that scene, Jeff would have bled out. Carlos and Jeff are still good friends today. So my question is, how do we take this paradigm of emergency responders where people are victims and we need to pull them out to the situation where we're empowering communities to help, to be involved in that disaster space? How do we change the paradigm of the emergency managers? What happened in Boston that allowed them to be OK with the fact that there were other people right where another bomb could have gone off? And I would say that this can be done through games. So that's what I do now. I build games, and my games are specifically in the disaster space. And I need to tell you first that I'm not a gamer. In fact, I hate games. <laughs> I'm invited to play games, and I'm always like, that's not my thing. Sorry, guys. Um, I kind of feel silly. I feel self-conscious. I don't want to participate. What if somebody judges me? I kind of feel that they're the realm of children. And, and they kind of are. Games are so important for children. Games are where children learn so much about the world around them. It's where they first learn to interact with other people. It's where they learn skills. They learn logic. They learn to piece things together. Think about when you were little and you started playing Clue. Slowly, you were given little pieces of information. 
you put it together, you weaved the story, and suddenly you're like, ah, I know who did it. It's Mrs. White in the den with the wrench. Oh, yeah. It's a great feeling when you put it together and when you figure that out. And so children learn logic, problem solving, but they also learn what it feels like to win. And they, feel, they realize what it feels like to lose. And it's a safe space for them to lose and to fail and to try again. And that's really important in childhood. Games for children are also a great space for children to understand the people with whom they interact. Games are where children start to explore social norms and rules. In games, you see the natural leaders emerge and the followers emerge. You also see a lot of the types of characteristics that those people might have future on, like what is their leadership skills? What is their leadership type? These worlds that children create are, are magical. They're amazing. We will never understand them. They have these rules that we just don't get. They're complicated, but the children understand them. And the children know that sometimes when other children break those rules, they need to deal with the children. And they create that, that complex world together. And it becomes a shared experience the children have. They become a community, an exclusive community that adults are not part of. And that's a magical thing that children have. And somewhere, as we were growing up, as I was growing up, I forgot that. I don't play anymore. I don't like games. I want reality. I want hard facts. I want to be taken as a serious adult. But almost everything about who I am today, I learned through games. Those are intrinsic learning that's still with me, and I would argue with every single one of you. How you interact with people, how you like to win or lose, you learned that through the power of games as a very small child. It didn't happen in grade one when your teacher taught you, you will act like this, or you will do that. It happened through games that you created with your friends and the school playground. OK, so what does this have to do with disasters? I believe that through games, we can get people to think differently about the disaster space. We can change the paradigms that they think. Because games are where people let go and start to explore new ideas, new ways of doing things. And it's a, it's a place where people can just disconnect from reality for a few minutes. So this is what I do. I build card games now. I build card games that bring people together and get them engaged in conversation in a new way. And maybe teach them a few things without them realizing. So a few components of my games. The first thing is you have to be able to win them. Because adults are skeptical. Adults don't want to play silly games. But a little friendly competition always goes a long way. And in my games, I want to give you a problem, a problem that you need to solve. So you want to win something you learned as a child because you like that feeling, and you want to solve the problem, right? But then I put something else in there. You can't solve the problem unless, of course, you work with the community. You have to figure it out together as a group. And then the next thing my games do is, is they try and remove the ego. They try and remove that self-conscious part of the person. And I do this by saying that when you play my game, you can't be who you are in the real world. So let's say that normally you are the general public. But when you play my game, I'm going to make you play the academic. So suddenly, you've gone from sitting over here and seeing this problem to sitting over here. And suddenly, it's a whole new view. It's a whole new way of exploring the problem. You still have all the knowledge that you've always had. And suddenly, you're applying it in a new way. Moreover, now that you're no longer the general public, you can say things that maybe you couldn't say when you were over here because your neighbor wouldn't have liked it. And you didn't really want to, to get on the bad side of your neighbor. So it gives you that space. It gives you that freedom. It creates that safe space for you to fail, just like we were when we were children. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm creating these spaces for people to come together and explore disasters in new and imaginative ways. And I think this is sustainable. I think it's replicable. And I think it's fun. And so I'm going to quickly give you an example of a success. I was lucky enough last week to be in Utah with the Global Disaster Innovation Group. And what they do is they take volunteers and they deploy them into disasters. And their mission is innovating real time in disasters. Pretty cool. But these people aren't first responders. They're not emergency management experts. They're just people who want to help. And they've got a huge variety of backgrounds. I was, just, I was blown away by like, the intellectual capital in this room. Roboticists, 
Next to you, graphic designers, 3D printers, science fiction writers. There was even an astronaut in the room. Like, <laughs> pretty intimidating stuff. And, and we wanted to bring them together and we wanted them to explore what their role would be in a disaster. How would they work? What would it be like? What were the norms and the culture values that this group was going to embody in a disaster? And so we could have done it the traditional way and we could have lectured. We could have said, this is what's important in a disaster. Or we could have played a game. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty intimidating when you sit down and you say, hey, Mr. Astronaut who's been in space, you wanna play a game with me? <laughs> But he did, he suspended his disbelief, and they played. They played a game with me, a card game, and this is the success. Halfway through, someone came to me and said, Tabitha, you've made a mistake on the game. And, and, and I'm more than open to the suggestion that I don't always get it right. I'm, I'm humble enough for that, so I said, okay, what's the mistake? And he said, well, on the actions you wrote, respond to the victims. We had a long conversation about that, and we wrote it up on our board as the actions that we want to implement, but we changed the word victim to survivor, and we want to give ourselves more points because we're responding to the survivor. Now, this is extremely important, and I'm going to step out for a second and tell you something about disasters and emergency management. Traditional emergency management, the language is very command and control. We talk about victims. Something tragic has happened to you. We are the expert. We're going to help you. We're going to tell you what you need, we're going to give it to you, and then we're going to leave. Emergent language, Boston language, is survivor focused. It's over here. Something tragic has happened to you. How can I help you? What do you need? Is there something I can give you that will empower you to help the rest of your community? This is extremely important emergent language in the disaster community. It's very hard for a lot of people to intrinsically understand or know. And so I had built it into the game to try and teach these people that we're not dealing with victims. We don't know better than the people who've been impacted. We're dealing with survivors. We want to help the people who are on the ground recover. We want to help empower them, and we want to give them ownership of the situation that they're in so they can move forward and grow. And so this was a very conscious decision of mine in the game. And so when he said, you've made a mistake, it shouldn't say victims, it should say survivors, I looked at him and I said, I didn't make a mistake, it's exactly what it should say. And he was angry, he was like <clears throat> And then he started to think, and he was like, oh, oh, I get it. All right, I'll tell the table. And he walked off, and he told them what had happened, and I thought, they've just won the game. They understand implicitly that we're not there to deal with victims, we're there to deal with survivors. And for the rest of the boot camp, I didn't hear the word victim, ever. So. I would argue games can change paradigms. Games can change how we think. Games can change, even as adults, the language that we use. Games can change so much about how we interact with people. And this is very, very, very powerful. Right now, I'm working in the disaster space. I'm building games to get people to rethink what the disaster space might look like before, during, and after a disaster. I want people to think about how we can communicate and work with the people in the disaster. But I truly believe that games can be applied to so many other situations. People want to be engaged in the conversations that impact their lives. Citizens, both in Canada and around the world, want to have far more impact on those conversations. They want to be involved, and I truly believe that games are a powerful way of bringing them together, of having those conversations that matter to them. So the game that I'm playing, what am I playing? I'm rethinking how people engage with each other through fun and interactive games. I'm rebuilding safe spaces for people to take risks and be okay with failure. I'm trying to bring people together through purposeful play to challenge their assumptions and biases. And that is the game that I'm playing. Thank you.